Is it possible to turn risk into profit? You know as a construction company owner or executive that the answer is yes. Frankly, that is the game in construction. It's managing risk and turning that risk into profit. And today my guest is Mike Heffernan. He is Executive Vice President at Alliant Insurance Services. He's an industry veteran with over 25 years of experience helping construction companies with their insurance requirements. We talk about three things. The first thing is the biggest mistake that construction companies make when purchasing insurance. We then take a dive into the biggest mistake that insurance companies make when selling insurance services to construction companies. And then we talk about turning risk into profit. And you're going to want to check out the video version of this podcast if you're just listening to the audio. You'll be able to get tons of value from the audio only, but on the video, I'm going to be sharing some slides that help to illustrate the discussion that we have. So pay close attention to that. By the way, in the show notes, there's a link that you can click on so that you can download the slides. And that'll be something that you can look at and consider and even share with other people in terms of grasping the topic that we are covering here today. Mike's very generous with his time and his insights. So feel free to reach out to him if you have any questions about your insurance programs. And I really appreciate you listening to Construction Genius today. Do me a favor, give us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. Share this episode with others. That's how we begin to really grow the um, number of people who are benefited by the show. And again, thank you for listening to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration. And this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Mike, welcome to Construction Genius. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. What is the biggest mistake that contractors make when they are purchasing insurance? One of, one of the biggest mistakes that I encounter uh, working with contractors when they procure insurance is this, this dynamic that takes place between the desire to have a very low priced, you know, very efficient uh, program with a low rate. And then the, um, the other side of the equation, which is the need for you to build a relationship over long periods of time with insurance carriers that are supporting your programs. And so I think long-term vision will always outweigh short-term gains that may be obtained through price shopping your insurance every 12 months. Okay. What I'd, li- I'd like to do, I know, I know you and I have had some offline discussions just f- um, framing the conversation today. So what I- I'd like to do real quick is just, I'm going to share my screen. And for those of you who are, are listening to the podcast, um, just on the audio, feel free to check out the video version because I'm going to be sharing a couple of different illustrations here that, that'll be able to help you think through this process. So, Mike, as we're looking at this, this particular slide here, there's a comparison between contractor A and contractor B. Can you just explain it a little bit? Yes, Eric, I'd be happy to. Um, this is sort of a simplified illustration of this topic uh, that we're talking about. And what I'm trying to sort of convey here in simplistic terms is that contractor A on the left of the slide, let's say that they're very fixated on cost and really laser focused and ask their brokers or instruct their brokers that, you know, every year I I expect you to go out and bid this insurance and I want to see three quotes from insurance carriers. And so, you know, year one, they go out and get a policy and spend capital to pay for the premium. And they have their losses and it's evaluated. Then next year they have a renewal. And let's say they move to a different insurance company because the the premium was more. And here you can see the premium went down. Yep. So the the buyer is thinking, oh, I'm smart. I know what I'm doing. I'm getting, by this competitive process, I'm getting lower rates and my premiums are going down. In this example, he got a 5% reduction. Next year, same thing. New insurance carrier, more efficiently priced program, got another 10% rate reduction. Really feeling like you're doing the right thing here and you're a really smart buyer of insurance. And then all of a sudden in that fourth year, you have an adverse 
year and you have a big loss, you have a big claim. Well, the problem with contractor A now is that he has moved this around and has kept shopping his insurance and garnered the benefit of a 5% rate reduction in one year and a 10% uh, rate reduction in the subsequent year. But then he goes into the next year and has a big loss. And then look what happens after the year with the big loss. He now has a 25% rate increase because the insurance carrier that sustained the loss has no historical premium in the bank to offset that large loss. So let let me ask you this. Is it true then that an insurance carrier, when they're pricing premium, they will take into account what they've already accumulated when pricing their insurance with a particular contractor? Absolutely. That's called a partnership. And they're not going to just look at the year in which the adverse loss occurred because your counter argument is, well, what about the other four years where you collected premium and I didn't give you any losses? So you only take money from me, but you don't give me a break when I give you money and you have a good year. So you had three good years. I had a bad year. So the next year after the bad year shouldn't be so bad, right? I mean, to me, that's just common sense. That's excellent. So really what we're talking about here is the difference between long-term thinking and short-term thinking. Why is it you think that some contractors struggle with this particular mindset that we're looking at here? I think it's probably the byproduct of probably two or three main drivers. The first one being, and I understand it, uh, contractors work in a very competitive environment and they are subject to this exact mentality of low bidder wins, you know, in construction, you know, owners that they work for require, you know, multiple parties to bid. Contractors get multiple bids from subcontractors. The whole philosophy of contracting is around a bid mentality. And so that it's immersed into their thinking. However, insurance and, and the procurement of insurance, I think, is a different dynamic. It's not contracting. You have to look at it in a different way. And so I think that low bid mentality, for lack of a better term, sometimes is what drives the, the bus. In addition to that, I think there's this dynamic within our industry where a contractor feels that that's the only way that you can keep a vendor honest. Right. You know, that, 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 that competitive aspect is what makes me feel like I'm not being taken advantage of. It's interesting because just as you're beginning to talk about this, I, the word partnering comes into my mind. And I know that's a, an increasing trend within the construction industry itself, where we're going from the adversarial owner against the, against the contractor or designer against the contractor to more of a partnering approach. And that seems to be what you're advocating here, not only with the people who you're you're building a project with, but then also those outside partners, such as insurance brokers. Absolutely. I mean, I think our business is uh, very much uh, a very intangible product, meaning I, I can't put something in front of you that you can touch or taste or feel or smell. It's very much me speaking and making promises and overtures around you know how things are going to happen. Uh, but I don't have anything to give you that you can that, that gives you that assurance. So it, this is basically a relationship that's being established where the contractor is saying, I believe what you're saying, and I don't think you're full of it. And you hope that you never really get tested in that regard. But in my experience doing this for almost 30 years now, every one of my clients at some point in time has an adverse event right. where insurance is going to need to, be, uh, need to respond. Yes, And I I don't want any of my clients to actually have those events, but for me as a professional providing those services, when it happens in in sort of an odd way, I actually get excited to a certain degree because that is where we get to prove what it is that we do. And the only way you're really going to establish that synergy and that relationship and that trust is by doing what you do together over long periods of time. I mean, friendships are built over lifetimes. And I don't see how you can create momentum if you're bouncing around and moving every year to a different player. You can't build a relationship in 12 months. You got to work at it. Yep. And so with this illustration that you have here, there's obviously, and, and again, it is an illustration, but but you have this idea of significant savings. The contractor can have significant savings if they're making a long-term commitment to one carrier, just because of that idea of premium being accumulated and therefore that being credited when those adverse um, situations occur. Yeah, I mean, this model is just for purposes of proving, you know, like illustrating a point, but yes, and if if this played out exactly how I had it 
modeled out for this discussion, the end result would be, you know, over a, a 10 year period, you would have reduced your cost of of insurance by 20% by doing it the way the contractor B does it. Yeah, interesting. Now, now tell me, we, we, we the first question was, you know, what, what are the mistakes that contractors make? But you've been in the industry for 30 years. You know it inside and out. What, what's, what's the biggest mistake that insurance brokers make when they're selling to contractors? And the reason I ask you that is because I know contractors are listening. So I want them to have some pointers to look out for when they are in the market for insurance. Well, I think it's a great question and a little bit difficult to answer only because it's got some some dynamics around it. But the reality of it is a broker is, is actually giving their client a disservice if they are reluctant or or just don't feel comfortable having a conversation like this with their client. It, you know, contractor A has has a mindset and contractors, let's just call it what it is. Con- some contractors out there, you know, some of the smartest people I've ever met, they're, they're savvy people and they take risk every day and manage it very well. But they're also very firm in their positions and it's very difficult to persuade them to think differently. And so they can be you know, a little heavy handed. So contractor A is going to say, this is how I do it. And if you're not able to do it, I will find someone else that will. And so it's very heavy handed. Right. You have to figure out a way to illustrate to contractor A what's happening in the illustration with contractor B. And that if he is not willing to listen, you have to say he's running the risk of not being competitive with the people that he's competing against. Our job is to provide information so that people can make informed decisions. Right. If you're just robotic and a puppet and you just do what they tell you, I, I think you're you're doing a disservice to your customer. So in other words, what you're saying is the biggest mistake that that insurance brokers make is by caving too quickly to the price imperative and not pushing back and presenting the reasons behind the premium and the logic behind it in terms of that long-term perspective. Yes. It's just instead of being just a yes, yes, I'll just go do that, whatever you say type of person. I think you have to, in a respectful way, find a way to have a conversation where they can be enlightened and understand that what you're trying to do here is make them better at what they're doing and make them smarter in the way in which they procure their insurance services. Okay. Okay. So obviously everyone has to buy insurance and we've covered so far a certain mindset of philosophy that you can take in terms of establishing long-term relationships with an insurance carrier and therefore reducing the amount of money that you spend on insurance over time. The real hook of what I want to get into here today, though, is this this thought of how to convert risk into profit and and how to use insurance to add one to two percent of profit to your bottom line. And and so I'd like to turn that turn to that particular topic. What is the mindset a contractor should have to convert risk into profit? Well, I think the mindset on this particular theme of you know risk turning into profit is centered around a contractor's confidence level in their performance uh, in the field in the areas where insurance becomes applicable. And that would be your safety performance. Do you have injuries in your workforce that happen when they're carrying out the work that they're performing? Or do you produce products and, and services that produce claims uh, at the at the end of the day because you built it incorrectly, you know, faulty work, you know, or or improper work. Generally speaking, I think contractors are pursuing jobs and bidding projects with the mindset that they can perform the work, they can do it without errors and omissions, and that they're going to do it safely. I think you have to have a mindset that you are confident that you know exactly what's going to happen each day that your workers go out into the field and that it's not some cum line bet where you're like, I don't know if we're going to get hurt or we're not. I mean, you should be able to answer that question, which is we are absolutely going to have no injuries today. Okay. Let me just pull up this other slide that we've we've kicked around a little bit, this idea of turning risk into profit, because I think with this slide, and again, if you're listening on the audio here today, I encourage you to make sure that you get the video because these the couple of slides that we're sharing here can be extremely helpful to you. Let's just begin to walk through this, Mike, in, in, in light of turning risk into profit. Yeah, this is just an attempt to try to, you know, take a static set of assumptions to illustrate a point. And if you're sort of looking at the illustration, we just made some baseline assumptions and said, you know, let's say it's a $250 million contractor yep. producing, you know, 
60 million dollars in payroll what is their insurance costs on an annualized basis so that was sort of what the baseline assumptions were yep. and then when you get in sort of to this middle section you'll see that there's two categories and that's really what i focus on and that is what i call the predicted risk layer and then the unpredicted risk layer yes what i like to focus on is the predicted layer and what i mean by that is those are the events that happen to the contractor year in and year out. If you were to go back and look at 11 years of their history, you would see that there was a very consistent, steady set of information that tells me this is their predicted risk layer. These claims happen every single year. And so I'm going to accept the fact that this is this is a known event. These are things that we know are going to happen. Right. And then the shaded area, the, the blue or gray shaded color there, is the unpredicted risk layer. Those are the things that happen that fall outside the normal course of the things that normally do happen. Those are the things that I would say are subject to insurance, meaning I want to buy insurance for those because they deviate from what is my normal trend. Okay, hold on a second, because there's a mindset there that about the purpose of insurance So give me a statement, a clear statement in your mind that really explains the purpose of insurance. I think there's room for broader discussions around this, but for the context of this discussion, to keep it simple, this is how I would answer that question. And and I would propose it in the form of a question. And, And it is, if you knew that you were going to have an expense for $5 tomorrow, would you buy an insurance policy to cover that $5 expense for a premium of $5? You would not. <laughs> it, do, it doesn't make sense. So, what, so what's happening is that in this predicted layer, yes, insurance companies aren't dumb. They, they, they're intelligent people. They understand what's going on here. You're basically going to an insurance company and saying, here's my predicted losses because part of the underwriting process, the first thing they ask you is, can I see your loss history? Well, why do they ask for that? Because they're looking to, to, to develop a trend. And so what they're going to do is say, well, Here's a predicted loss layer, and we know that those are going to happen, meaning we're going to have to pay for them. So we're going to get 100% of our cost in the predicted layer. We're we're being reimbursed for that. Yep. And then we're charging an additional premium for the losses that are less likely to happen, but will be of higher magnitude because they are unpredictable. They're, They're the black swan events that happen in the world, unfortunately. And those are the things that a contractor should be looking to hedge or buy insurance for because the balance sheet can't sustain it. Yep. So on this slide here, it's really interesting. 81% of all claims on this slide here are less than $25,000. Yeah. For this illustration, and, and quite frankly, just so you understand, this came from a real world client that we represent. Uh-huh. So for this particular scenario that we've painted here, Yes, 81% of the claims that they produce are $25,000 or less, and that represents 41% of their total claim volume. Okay, so then how am I, let's say I'm this contractor here, I do $250 million a year, how then can I turn risk into profit? Well, in this particular instance, if you were to look at the bullets that are included on the right of the illustration, the claims expense that's associated with these 81% of the claims is a million four. Yep. The insurance company charged a premium of 2.3 million for that million four in losses. <laughs> so my point is if I self-insured that layer yep. and I had a million four in expenses, so I paid a million four, but I didn't pay 2.3. I just saved money. Yep. And so my point is that a contractor can use this predictive analysis just like the insurance companies do, can charge the project the 2.3 million, because that's what they were charging anyways in the form of their premium. Right. And then let's say they have a million four in losses. Well, the difference between 2.3 and 1.4 is profit. Yep. They get to keep the money. So then the mindset that they should adopt is this one of of self-insuring for those claims that are less than $25,000, that predictive layer. And then what's the next step they should take if they want to continue to turn that risk into profit? Well, on the slide that we were looking at earlier, where we were trying to illustrate the philosophies of buying insurance, contractor A versus contractor B, you can see, you know, year one, year two, year three, you know, they had losses, but they they weren't terrible. They were, they were predictive layer losses. 
Right. And then your your four, your six, your eight that are illustrated in that orange color, we just uh, those were the percent. adverse, unpredicted layer years. So yeah. you'll see that if you're charging a, a consistent rate in your cost of work in that predictive risk layer, and you're not having adverse losses, you're eventually, in this, in this instance, 11 years, I only had three that were adverse. So in eight of those uh, 11 years, I'm going to be able to convert profit in the form of I charged the job a certain level of remuneration for the risks that I've quantified, but I out I, I beat my predictive risk layer, meaning I performed better than my predictions. So I've now made a return on the charges that I've assessed for insurance premiums, which is the equivalency of what an insurance company does. They charge a premium. And if they don't pay out losses that are greater than the premium, that's called underwriting profit. Yep. Okay. So then I'm, I'm going to make a commitment then to really working hard on that predictive risk layer, that predicted risk layer in terms yeah. of maximizing, turning that risk into profit. So obviously right. I take that into account, that risk into account when I'm bidding the work. What else am I doing in terms of what am I focusing on in order to get that profit number uh, increased as much as possible? I think that's a, that's a great question. I I, I'll, I'll try to make this real simple because because I think it can be simple. You talk about predictive losses. They're, they're predicted. Like I, I know they're going to happen. I'll look at it from a contractor's perspective. If a contractor is performing work, let's say they're, they, they do topping slabs on a podium deck for a, for a concrete structure. Yep. Well, if they routinely get claims for issues involving errors that they've made in performing the work and pouring the concrete and and, and doing the topping slab work. Well, my intuition tells me that that contractor sooner or later is going to say, we're doing something wrong. Let's go investigate what the root issue is and let's fix that so that we don't keep making the same mistake. Right. Like they're not going to just keep doing it because they know they're doing it wrong. So I, taking that analogy, it's no different when it comes to these predicted losses. My point being, you know they're going to happen. You have empirical evidence that this happens year after year after year after year. Well, why are you allowing things that you know are happening to keep happening? They're predictive, which means they're preventative. Yes. So what you do is you focus your efforts on figuring out how do we prevent these losses from happening because we know that they're happening and we probably know why they're happening. Yep. And so, so to the extent that you can mitigate and stop them from happening, then you're going to just be able to keep more of the dollars that you're build, building into your cost of work in that predictive layer because you're pricing it at the equivalency of what the premium would be if you didn't do this. And so your pricing isn't getting inflated. You're not, you're, you're not making yourself less competitive. And if you prevent the losses, you're just keeping more of the premium, which means profit. Okay. So- You've been in the business now for 30 years, and the logic of what we're talking about here is something I think that, that most people are listening here grasp, right? If they're, if they're predictive, they're preventative, and therefore, let's talk about mitigation. Now, it's one thing to know that intellectually. It's another thing to execute that in your business so that you do turn that risk into profit. As you've observed contractors over the years and as you've worked with them, what do you find the very best contractors do to turn that risk into profit? What are they doing on a daily and a weekly basis? The ones that do it the best make serious rates of return on insurance. They're very good at it. And it's not by accident. The reason why they're good at it is because they have created a culture within that organization that basically does not allow for excuses around, you know, why these things happen. You know, everyone will be able to tell you a million reasons why someone gets hurt on a job site or gets in an automobile accident or whatever the, the issue may be. Yep. And the counter arguments will be things like, well, it's the, the, labor, the labor market is very tight. We can't find workers. There's no skilled craftsmen. We just are lucky if we get a body. You know, those are all the counter arguments to why these things happen. And it's like, we can't do the work if we don't get people, but the people aren't qualified. I get it. And I understand that those are realities of the construction market. However, I find it odd that the ones that do it the best who are in the exact same environment don't have those situations. They don't have the claims with the same people, yep. the, the same labor pool. So I'm convinced that there's a way to control behaviors and it starts with 
the very top of, a, of, of the leadership tree at a company that basically sets the stage on day one to say, we work safe and we don't have losses. And that's just the way it goes here. Yep. So then it's, it's easier, it really, said, easier yeah, go ahead. than done. Yep. So it starts at the top with a intolerance for slackness around safety issues. And it's something that's consistently communicated throughout the organization. Absolutely. And, you know, it has to be, it's not lip service. And I think there's a lot of contractors out there that do a very good job with this. I mean, I see CEOs of construction companies that are literally walking the walk and and behaving the way that they, you know, expect their their people that are doing the work in the fields to, to behave. And that's how I think you affect behaviors. Okay. Do you think that the contractors who do it the best, do they have any difference in the way that they communicate the safety culture in terms of rhythm? Is it is there a difference between people who just do it occasionally and people who do it every single day? I, have you seen that? Yeah, I mean, I have the privilege of representing contractors of all shapes and sizes and of yep. all levels of quality. And the ones that do it the best, safety and topics around safety are not like, let's talk about this once a month or let's talk about this once a quarter. Safety is something that is a mandatory discussion Yes. Every week. Yes. And when I say mandatory, it, it involves the highest levels of the organization participating in a meeting with everybody that is responsible for safety. And it's it those meetings transpire without exception, meaning they don't cancel them. Yes. They don't get too busy to make it. They they it is a priority meeting. It happens once a week, you know, once a month, whatever the frequency, and it is built into the fabric and is just as important as any other meeting that they're having. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we started off by talking about the biggest mistake that contractors make when they're purchasing insurance. And um, again, going back to this slide, your argument is purchasing insurance based solely on price and renegotiating every year is a a bad strategy, a bad long-term strategy for a contractor to take. Uh, Yes. I can prove to you time over time and time again, that contractor A will never win when you look at things over long term. Yep. And and just to add to that, Eric, if you if to put it in perspective, contractor A and contractor B, contractor A would never do this if we were talking about contract surety. They're surety bonds. Right? They don't go out they don't go out to a surety every 12 months and bid out the surety bond rate because they recognize that that is a very important instrument. That is credit. That's like my banking relationship. Right. I have to build I have to build a relationship. They have to be confident in me. I have to trust they're going to be there when I need them. They spend time and build a long-term relationship. Surety is like the crown jewel of the contractor with respect to it being very important. I have no idea why they don't perceive insurance the same way because they spend an awful lot of time on insurance and they seem to get very frustrated around insurance. I think contractor B has less frustrations because he's building relationships and things go the way they're supposed to go because trust has been established. Well, you see, it's interesting because then you speak to the second thing that we covered there is is the biggest mistake that insurance companies make or insurance brokers when they're selling. And that's just not standing up and saying, hey, listen, contractor, if you if you're going to just drive this based on price, this is going to be the long term effect. And I think it's really interesting. You just said that as far as a construction company is concerned, you should have the same commitment to a long-term relationship with your insurance broker as you would with your surety person or with your banker. I think so. I think they, they're they different products and they serve different purposes, but I think the concepts are the same. Excellent. Excellent. And then we and then we cover this idea of turning risk into profit. And, and um, I just want to make that emphasis again. And the basic philosophy or outlook is this self-insure for those claims under $25,000, and then work really hard at reducing the, the number of claims or incidences in those areas so that you can capture that profit and put it to the bottom line of the organization. Yes. And, and with the understanding being that you'll have very efficient, you know, lean years, and yeah. then occasionally you'll have an adverse year. Well, those lean years are, are the years in which you've built up this surplus to subsidize the years where you have to pay the claims. And so that that to me, over long periods of time, if you count up all the chips, you'll have eight years of profit and three years of loss. Those eight years of profit will subsidize and pay for the three years of loss. 
Excellent. Excellent. Um, Let me ask you, Mike, do you mind if I do a PDF of this slide on the contractor risk purchasing illustration and then turning risk into profit? Can we put those into into the um, the show notes so that people can take a look at those? Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, yeah there's Excellent. nothing. There's, there's there's no secret launch codes in any of this or anything like that. It's pretty simple stuff. Awesome. Great. So I'm, I'm going to have those in the show notes just so that you guys can look at them and, and, and think about them as you're, you're considering what we've talked about here today. Mike, you're, you've been really generous with your time and your insights. Tell us a little bit more about you and what you do with construction companies. Uh, sure, Eric. I work with a company by the name of Alliant uh, Insurance Services, and I'm part of a division that we call the Construction Services Group. And that's our, our specialty division that is geared exclusively to working with contractors and real estate developers that, you know, build uh, projects that contractors work on. And for about 25 of the 30 years that I've been in insurance, uh, my my days sort of start and end with uh, a pursuit of, you know, working with contractors to help them identify risk and, and develop strategies on how to manage that risk. And in many instances, doing things such as we're talking about today, which is to try to try to look at risk in a different perspective, just like contractors do with the entire project. And the entire project is just a bowl of risk. So I like to just my area of competencies is to take the insurance components and say, well, there's risk here. Let's look at it and analyze it and find out a way to make a profit in that category, just like you do on all the other categories of the jobs that you work on. And so it's a philosophy and a concept that contractors understand, but they, they view insurance in a different perspective. And my primary role and objectives here is to try to get them to look at it differently and to embrace new concepts. And the ones that do tend to be pleasantly surprised because they see the positive impacts that can happen when you do take this risk component and turn it into a profitable venture within the company. That's great. That's great. And if people want to get in touch with you, how can they get in touch with you? I, uh, our website is www.alliant.com if they want to take a look at the firm. And then my direct contact information, my email is uh, my first initial M, last name Heffernan, H-E-F-F-E-R-N-A-N, at Alliant, A-L-L-I-A-N-T dot com. And my direct line is 408-352-6701. And I'm here in San Jose, California. Awesome. We're going to put all that information into the show notes. Um, I'm pulling up a slide here right now, just with that high level contact information. Mike, I really appreciate your time. You're there in San Jose. So I've got a quick question I want to ask. If if I'm going out to dinner in San Jose, what's the one place I need to go to? Putting you on the spot here. I know, I know, I know. (laughs) Because the the world's been uh, on dead stop for so long. Uh, A lot of the places that we used to frequent were closed for so long that I'm not even sure if some of them are open. I'd probably say, you know, in a local area of downtown, if you just up for a good steak, it just opened. I would say Monty's is a pretty good place to go right here in the downtown corridor. All right. Monty's. If you're in San Jose catching a Sharks game or something like that, uh, then Monty's uh, in downtown. We'll, but we'll uh, find that one and put it in the show notes as well. Mike, I really appreciate okay. your time here today. Thanks, Eric. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate the time as well. Awesome. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care. Today's episode was brought to you by the Construction Conclave. If you as a construction leader would like to develop your skills and get involved in a community of like-minded construction professionals who are focused on building healthy teams, profitable projects, and long-term successful businesses, then the Construction Conclave is for you. It's a private invitation-only group of construction leaders that are focused on developing their leadership skills. We do training every single month online that looks at how to become a better leader in a very practical, straightforward way. We also have other events that build community and camaraderie so that you can associate with others who are interested in developing their skills as leaders. If you'd like more information and to see if you qualify for participating in the Conclave, feel free to reach out to me, eric at eric anderton.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Construction Genius. Hope you found that 1% of inspiration to help you in the next few days. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review on iTunes, share it with other construction leaders who you think would benefit, and thanks again for listening.